Well, hey, good morning. Welcome. Will you find a seat? Will you grab your Bibles? We are going to study the text this morning. So find a seat, grab your Bibles, and turn to the book of James chapter 4. James chapter 4. We have been systematically working through the book of James as a church, and today we fall into James chapter 4. Um, if you came this morning for a positive, encouraging K-Love teaching, I'm so sorry. Um, dude, James just gets, gets pretty crazy. Last week, Pastor Greg finished James chapter 3, and I knew that Sunday that I would open James chapter 4 this weekend, and he kept saying last weekend, man, James is just so in your face, and it's just so difficult. And I kept thinking to myself, stop saying that, because it gets worse. James 4 is just like, man. And, and I love to teach things that just feel poetic and, and look nice and feel good, but we're going to dive in just headfirst to James chapter 4. We're going to study as a church. I'd love for you, if you have a Bible, read with me, study with me. There's a lot to unpack. I want to read verses 1 through 10. There's really three sections that James is going to walk us through, and we're going to kind of name them, pick them apart, and summarize them to see if we might be able to see the bigger view of what James is saying. So James chapter 4. Um, last week, Pastor Greg finished in chapter 3, and he really talked about wisdom from the world and wisdom from the Lord, and how, how they're different, how we can draw from wisdom from the world, uh, and it can benefit us now. It's this temporary thing, but wisdom from God is not, and James really jumps right into chapter 4. So I'm going to actually start with verse 18 in chapter 3, and then we're going to dive right into chapter 4. I'm going to read 1 through 10. We'll come back and summarize it. Will you do me a favor? Your favorite pastor thing to do. Uh, will you stand with me while we read the scripture? Just to honor it and say, I'm going to give you full attention right now. James, we're going to start in chapter 3, verse 18, and then I'm going to read 4, um, 1 through 10. If you're ready, say, I'm ready. Okay. I don't know if you are, but here we go. It says this in verse 18, chapter 3. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. Chapter 4, verse 1. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose it is to no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us, but he gives more grace? Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched, and mourn, and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning, and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. You can have a seat. Uh, thank you, James, for writing that. I appreciate you. Um, how many of you ever read the scripture? For me specifically, it's the Old Testament or James chapter 4. And as soon as you read it, you instantly think, I have a friend that this would be perfect for. This fits you to the, and you copy and paste it. Maybe you kick it over to him and you're like, hey, bro, just read this in James chapter four, you adulterous people, like this is for you, right? That is usually when I read the text and it's difficult, I instantly go like this, like, oh, that's for you, that's for you, that's for you. I think we have to do something before we start to study James chapter four. I think we should do this with all scripture, but specifically here. James is writing to you, to me. He's not writing to the person next to you. 
He's going to draw this painting for us. He's got this blank canvas. We're going to go through and he's going to paint something. And it's actually really difficult to look at. It's very difficult. It's more difficult when you actually put yourself in the painting and you allow James to write out some of the things that are inside of you. We have to allow the scripture to penetrate our soul. That's what it's for. I know that's not a popular idea. I know that uh, you didn't wake up this morning and get dressed and think to yourself, I'm so excited to come read James chapter 4 and talk about adulterous people and how they're actually enemies to the Lord. When we do this, something beautiful happens. I came in here yesterday to run through my teaching, and I felt like the Lord just said, I want you to, to live some of this out. So I literally laid on the floor, and I cried for like an hour. I dare you as we study James chapter 4 to let it penetrate who you are. Don't think about other people, but allow yourself to really step into the story. So let's dive in. This is the first section. Uh, it's verses 1 through 3. I've titled this, The War Inside of You, and we're going to dive in James chapter 4. He says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Two words to look at here. Quarrels, it means war and battle. And then this word fight, it means a battle that is controversy. It's fight or combat. So James begins painting this picture, and it's you and I. And we're actually on this battlefield fighting in combat with one another. He says, what causes you to war in battle and fight in combat? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? Your passions, meaning your desire for pleasure, are at war within you. That word war is another picture that James gives us. It says, contending with carnal inclinations. The picture that we're given in the original language is a military leader leading soldiers around. So you and I on a battlefield fighting one another because there's this thing called desire for pleasure inside of us. And it's like a military leader taking us left and right. This is the picture that James is giving us. I don't know about you, but I have never seen a time with this much division and opposition in the world. Anybody agree with me? What's interesting to me, though, is it's not just division with unbelievers or division because it's the political season and so naturally people have different sides. No, the division is actually in the church. James is writing to the church. He's not writing to unbelievers. I think before we can address this fighting and quarreling that's happening on the outside, we have to first address the war that's going on right here in our hearts. Humanity was so looking for a savior that would come and rescue them from captivity and eliminate this enemy that was keeping them captive. And the disciples would often tell Jesus, like, hey, it's time, we should go. And he always reminded them, hey, I actually came for your heart. I came for this war that's going on inside of you. And this is what James is talking about. He'll continue in verse 2. He says, you desire means you set your heart upon and you do not have, so you murder. It's a little extreme if you ask me. Like, that's, that's a big word to say. Um, Jesus equates anger to something in the Bible. Does anybody know what it is? Anger is what? Murder. James is speaking of a similar idea. You desire, you set your heart upon, and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. He repeats himself here. He's going to repeat himself quite often in chapter 4. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. Knowing that this passion inside of us is like a military leader leading us around. I think it's interesting, and I, I caught this this morning. You'd ask the Lord to fund the military leader inside of you to continue leading you around. And he says no. And now we're about to dive into the second section. So James has painted a picture for us. It's a war zone. 
You and I are on it. We're fighting one another. There's this military leader leading us around. It's our desire for pleasure. And we're on this thing fighting with each other. So much so that we're willing to murder one another. And now James is going to rebuke us and remind us of the lens that the Father has towards us. This is section 2. Uh, we'll be in verse 4. It's verse 4 and 5. This is the rebuke and the reminder. Are you ready? This is like nuts, you guys. This is hard. Verse 4. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? And then he repeats himself. Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. In verse 5, he'll remind us. But I want to look at this rebuke. We, we've just come from chapter 3 where James has described the fruit of wisdom from the world and wisdom from above or from the Lord. I think we have to be careful when we read friendship with the world is enmity with God. If we're not careful, I think a lot of us might think what James is really saying is we should disconnect from humanity, never talk to anybody, and just be a friend to the Lord. That's not what he's saying. This word friendship means fondness. So to, to lean in to something. Fondness with the world. That word means cosmos in the Greek. And it actually means orderly arrangement. That is decoration. Things of the world. Huh. Just came from chapter 3 where James is saying, you can get worldly wisdom and here's the things that it will bring. Jealousy, envy, pride, greed. Huh. James is talking about that now. He's almost saying, do you not understand yet? You're fighting with one another. It's ridiculous. You're on this war zone. I'm going to use military language. He like steps it up. It's military language now. You're fighting in battle. It's all over the place. You're willing to murder one another. Do you not see yet? It's this passion inside of you. It's this worldly wisdom that we want right away because we think it solves something now. And this is what James is addressing Friendship with the world, fondness with creation, with the things of the world. This is a pretty broad statement. It could mean a lot of different things for different people. But he's painting a picture for us. So what does that picture look like to you? Is it fondness with status? Is it fondness with different relationships? Is it leaning into the job that you should have? So you're going to go after everything. You'll literally abandon everything just for this job. And this military leader is literally leading you into this thing. Is it different churches or political agendas or different? What, what is the things that James is speaking of? I think you have to be the person that puts that idea there in that text. We know that he's clearly saying, when you place things, creation, above the creator, you actually stand as an adulterer before the Lord. Yikes. That is, that is insane. Never once when I have read the scriptures have I thought to myself when I read through something like this, oh, that's you. That oh, makes sense. That'll be you. Never. I've been reading the text differently, and I, I want to invite you to do it. This is how I've been reading at James 4, specifically verse 4. Travis, you adulterer, do you not know that leaning into worldly wisdom, that leaning into things that might benefit you now and you place it above the creator, that actually places you as an adulterer before the Lord? It takes different weight when you read it that way. And again, James is painting this picture. I dare you to place yourself in it. He'll finally remind us in verse 5. And this is what he says in verse 5. It's the rebuke and then the reminder. He says, Or do you suppose it is to no purpose? 
that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us. Yearns jealously. That word means to intensely crave possession, to long for. Man. So James is painting this picture for us. It's a war zone. You and I are on it. We're fighting with one another because this military leader inside of us is pulling us around. We so desire this earthly wisdom that benefits us now. So we're willing to do whatever it takes to get it. It's like we have these blindfolds on. We're not quite sure what we're doing, but we know that it's going to satisfy something right now. And then he starts to add on the top corner of this portrait, a picture of the father. I imagine he's looking over this war zone and he's just saying, no, I just want your possession. That's all I want. And we're fighting. It's really a sad story. It's horrible. It's the moment of the movie that's at its lowest point. It's just awful. The father just desiring us. But you and I being so caught up in this earthly wisdom of the now. And he'll continue. This is section three. We're looking at this painting as difficult as it might be. And we get to verse six. And James will say this. But he gives more grace. Hmm. That's like a breath of fresh air. Especially in this painting that's really difficult to look at. But he gives more grace. This word gives, it doesn't just mean to hand you something like it does in our language if I gave you something. The word gives means the adventure of delivering or to suffer. The word in itself means to suffer. The word is the redemptive picture of God delivering his son to the world to suffer on our behalf. But he delivers his son to suffer For what? More grace. Two parts to this word. First part being larger, more. Grace. This word grace means that which affords joy and pleasure. And for me, when you understand the text, it even gets crazier. So you and I on this battlefield fighting one another for what? Pleasure. It's like a military leader leading us. Well, it's possible to have, but it's only delivered through the creator, not through Creation will continue, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace, delivers that which affords joy to the humble. God opposes the proud. Opposes is a terrifying word. The word means to rage in battle against. Proud meaning those appearing to be above others. So God rages in battle against those appearing to be above others, but delivers that which affords joy and pleasure, gives grace to who? The humble. Humble is quite literally the opposite of proud. It means to be cast down low. The picture that we see is not rising far from the ground. So this desire for pleasure inside of us, it's actually possible to have. You just can't ever, you'll never find it through earthly wisdom and through fighting this battle. That is how the world would like to tell you that it's found. If you go fight now, if you go get yours, you'll have it. Make your own way. Do you. Whatever you need to do to make it happen, just make it happen. And James is giving us a picture that's completely opposite. Everything that you would naturally respond to this situation is completely opposite from how James is teaching us. He says, submit yourself in verse 7. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is the invitation that James is painting for us. 
Uh, resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's like the most popular Christian community slang like ever. Hey, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I've heard it all of the time. When someone's going through something difficult or it's, you know, they're going through a trouble or temptation, a lot of the response is, hey, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The word resist means to, to oppose, to stand against. Could I suggest that the only reason that resist the devil and he will flee from you is a familiar term amongst believers is because it's another war term idea. And we have become so comfortable operating on this battlefield of war with one another. So when we hear the word resist, we're like, oh yeah, that's me. I get that. I, I'm so comfortable with this. It makes sense. How do we miss it? There's two parts to this idea. And somehow I, I've completely missed it. The first part, submit yourself. This is horrible military advice. This is not a war term. It means to place under, to put under, or arrange under. Submit yourself, place yourself underneath the Lord, and then resist. Huh. When you get th this idea backwards, it's really dangerous. It's, 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 it's horrible. Uh, humanity has a terrible batting average against the devil. We're zero. It's really bad. History has proven this idea. When you try to resist the devil before first coming underneath the government and authority of the Father, you will lose 10 out of 10 times. I guarantee you. History proves it. Go read, go read Genesis. Go look at history when people try this idea. It doesn't work. And somehow, we've missed it. The first invitation is not a war term. It's to submit yourself. And James is walking us through and painting this picture of this process of you and I on this war zone. The father just wanting our possession. And James telling us how to, get, how to do that. Which is to be humble. To submit. To actually not rise up far from the ground. We have to become a people that when wars and battles and fighting surfaces in our city, in our home, in our nation, in our church, we have to be a people. Stop. We take our eyes off of what's right in front of us. We keep our eyes fixed on him and we actually surrender. Like, you know what? Um, your eyes stop. I surrender. My eyes are fixed on him. Not that there's not a time to resist. Not that you won't be by yourself sometimes and the enemy approaches and you're like, oh, I'm just going like, to lay down here. No, that's not at all what the text is saying. It's first before the Lord. That peace has to be first before anything else happens. That is the invitation from James. He'll continue in verse 8. Draw near to God. And he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. He just repeated himself again. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he'll exalt you. James is painting this picture now of this repenting process before the Lord. It's really messy. I was talking to a friend this morning about what I was teaching and honestly had this moment with the Lord where I was so thankful that the Bible is actually really messy. I know as believers, we like to say like, hey, this is God's word, like it's perfect and true and holy. Yes, it is. I agree with you. I'm on your team. But it's messy. There are people in here that were awful people. There are statements that are very hard to take and be like, yeah, I actually have to move into that. It's very, very messy and difficult. But God is in the midst of all of it. This word be wretched, it means to realize one's own misery, heaviness, and hardship. So there's more to this painting that James is making for us. And really in this moment, it's perspective changing. It started off this blank canvas, and then he starts painting, and we see this war zone. You and I are on it, fighting one another. The father is looking over the war. No, I just want your possession and the person you're fighting. I just want all of your hearts. 
And then perspective changes. It's like these blindfolds were taken off and we actually stop. We lay down our weapons and we actually get on the floor. We become humble, not rising far from the ground because we realize that we're in the presence of the almighty God and we begin to weep and mourn and recognize our own heaviness and hardship. Maybe for some of us, you begin to recognize that you became really infatuated with earthly wisdom that James was talking about in chapter 3. That you thought that you could benefit yourself now and you were so excited about what you were pursuing. You even put God's name on it. This is for the Lord. I'm going to do this so I can. And you realized, man, that was earthly wisdom. And when I did that, I actually stood as an adulterer before him. So you begin to weep and you get on the floor. Or maybe for some of us, I think there's a lot of, lot of us in this room that have been fighting this battle for years. You're like, COVID, whatever, dude. I've been in this thing for like ever. And you're exhausted. You're tired. And you actually realize that in this battle, you really hurt and damaged a lot of people. So you begin to weep. In the presence of God, you get on the floor. Because really the only thing that can happen in this battle on this war zone is friendly fire to other image bearers. Because the father yearns jealously for the person you disagree with. And you weep and you mourn. And it's this messy process. But it is only in that posture in James 4 that the Lord steps in. That's the only posture in James 4. He will rage in battle against those appearing to be above others. My goodness. But he steps in. He kneels down in this painting. We're on the floor, sobbing, and he elevates us. Humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. There's a couple things that I see James inviting us into in chapter four. The first thing is to remember. Man, I know it's hard to remember when you're in the middle of a fight, but remember, let me remind you, he yearns jealously. He intensely craves your heart. And that person that you're so fired up against, he yearns jealously and intensely craves their heart. We have to remember. For me, it's daily. Sometimes it's every 10 minutes. Oh, yeah, God wants you too. Eh, I don't like you very much, but God really wants you. Remember. The second thing is this. Stop. Stop. I know it's really popular right now even in, in Christian communities, to say, it's time to get up and go to war, guys. Here we go. Man, I don't see that in the text. That's not how I see Jesus handling life. That's not how I see James walking very clearly how we are to respond when fighting and quarrels begin to happen. Stop. The war is over. We know the end of the story. The war is completely over. That doesn't mean life won't get crazy. Man, 2020 has shown us that. Life will get crazy. The war, man, when we get before him and we get really, really low and we actually repent, he deals with us. He elevates us, actually. And the last thing is this. Submit yourself to the Lord. Get really low. I think in this season as the church, we're actually just called to surrender. Yep, I surrender. My eyes are fixed on him. Because 2020 showed us what it's like to try to pull earthly wisdom and benefit ourselves right now. It's really exhausting. It's really tiring. It's really hurtful. It's really confusing. And James is laying out, listen, get really low before him. Because that is where he will elevate us. I want to be a people that are known in this city. Yeah, we just surrendered. Ah, I don't have a lot to say. We just get in his presence and get really, really low. And man, he elevates us and he moves. And it's beautiful. Could you imagine 
if the people of God actually took this idea to heart and did it. Could you imagine how elevating he would be to the people of God in the church? Because those that get really low, he, he likes to elevate. That is what I see in James chapter 4. Will you put your hand on your heart? I want to pray over you guys. Hmm. Father, thank you so much for your word. Lord, even when it is very honest, we just say thank you for all of it. Lord, my heart is that you would speak to every person in this room. Lord, that as we go throughout our week, we'd go back to James and we'd look through it and your voice would be so tender. So Lord, I just release your voice and your spirit to speak to our hearts. Be with us as we go throughout our week. Lord, begin to remind us different areas that we're putting before you. Lord, remind us that you just want our heart. We surrender and give it to you. We repent right now and say, Lord, we just want more of you. We get really low in your presence. And we just say to our souls that you are sovereign. You're in control. We love you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen.